Hey, it's pleasant, right? No. no. <laughs> so this week, while I was prepping for today, on Wednesday night, I quite by accident came across a social media post that had me, has me quite disturbed. Um, this post was on a closed user group, I won't say which network, and it was created for a community. And the post entailed a video of a pastor who received a word of wisdom and then proceeded to lay hands, which we believe in, to pray for healing for a specific person. So the post was nothing out of the ordinary for us here today, and there was nothing too drastic about that. But the post went out to 26,000 members on this group. And thereafter were 283 comments that attacked the validity of the video. And I was so disheartened because this particular group was created for residents and ex-residents of a town that I spent almost five years of my life growing up in. A town that members in my family have spent more than 20 years in. A place we still today, although it was many years ago, call our hometown. And I felt so sad for the people who had become so cynical and hard-hearted to the things of God. But we know that there's nothing new that we see today. And so the Bible tells us what this looks like and shows us what the implications are when we see this in our world today and in our society. So turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 6. There. So from verse 1, <clears throat> Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in their synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom he's been given? that he even does miracles. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this the Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own house is a prophet without honor. He could do no miracles there, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. So it's helpful to know where in the book this falls. You see, the first five chapters of the Gospel of Mark are dedicated to countless numbers of signs and wonders that Jesus went from town to town performing. Incredible miracles were seen by the people who believed in this man that came around. So much so that crowds were pushing up against him to reach him. They were constantly making their way so that they could get to him because they knew if they could get to this man, they too could receive their miraculous healing and deliverances from evil spirits. And so in the story, Jesus is on his way to a house where a girl is sick and he's about to raise this girl from the dead when on the way, another woman who'd been hemorrhaging for 12 years touches him and she gets healed and then he goes off to this person's house and raises this girl from the dead. Miracles like we've not seen half of us today and immediately after he journeys on to his hometown how many of you still live in your hometown many of us have moved away but can you imagine what it's like <coughs> to prepare yourself for a journey to set back to the place where you were born in where your parents might still live today 
where you were raised. Can you imagine the feeling of going back to those familiar places, your old school, places where you met your first friends, seeing where your parents raised you, playing on the street corners you used to play on or the old playground you used to, shopping in shops and shopping malls that you used to walk to. This is what our hometown was like. We used to work, walk to church on a Sunday. Now Christians are being mocked for their faith there in a group of 26,000 people. So I would imagine Jesus had the same nostalgia and sentiment of going back home. And he's got all of these stories. He's returning with much popularity because he's got these amazing adventures to tell the people. His own people in his own hometown. But when he gets there, it's a completely different picture to every other place he's been to. Everywhere else, people's lives were changed when they welcomed this man. But in his own hometown, they said, we know him. Isn't he that guy from down the street? And his parents live there. He's the carpenter, isn't he? They judged him on his profession, on where he was born, and on who his family was. And they made a decision then and there. This man can be of no good to us. There's nothing ordinary about this, extraordinary about this man. And although they heard his teaching, we know that faith comes by hearing the message of God. Jesus was still amazed at their lack of faith. How then did they not have faith if they heard the word of God? It says they heard his teaching and were amazed, but then they had no faith. It is because they rejected the person that brought them the message. Jesus was not who they expected. Very often, we reject the person bringing us the message of God. So think about what it is you've asked God for and you're still waiting on. And now think, have you rejected the person that God sent it with? Because if you're still waiting on the Lord, it's very likely that God has already sent it with someone and you've rejected the messenger. So what were the consequences for these people? Many of us say here, yeah, I would never do that. If I saw Jesus... I know he's Jesus. I'm not going to reject him. Who here would reject Jesus? But we do it to other people, don't we? And we disqualify them on our own standards and measures. We use age, we use race, we use sex. But are we really prepared to receive someone that we don't expect? You see, Jesus was the unlikely person. And then he says these words, a prophet is without honor in his own hometown. This is not what Jesus intended for his people. He intends to use people, but we reject the person. Immediately after this, we see in the text that Jesus sends out his 12 disciples. So we think that a prophet is just someone who calls himself a prophet, and I don't mean just, but a prophet, someone who's got the calling or an office of a prophet. Here, Jesus is referring to somebody who declares the word of the Lord. How do we know this? Because he sent his 12 out. Look down in verse 13, what it says. After the 12 go out to preach, he gives them instructions. And it says, they, the 12, not all prophets, people sent by God, they drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. How could these people that Jesus sent do something Jesus couldn't do? Is Jesus not God? What was he limited by? He was limited because the people would not receive him. Where these 12 went, the people acknowledged they were sent by God. That was the difference. So then, what excuses do we make? We have many, many plausible excuses in today's day and age, don't we? We can say, yeah, well, you don't know. We're, this is Africa, guys. I mean, like, people are claiming to be from God, but then they're making people eat grass and drink detergents or petrol or I don't even know half the crazy things people are doing. 
it's just safer for me to just me and God, Lord, you and me, you speak to me, I'll do what you say. I, I can't trust people, you know, it, it's, it's too hard. But God doesn't change the way he operates. He's given us the church, which is a group of people, so that you can hear what he has to say with the people around you. It was two weeks ago I asked someone in the church to help me with something. So I've been praying for about six months about a specific area in my life, and it was the strangest thing. I'd pray for somebody else and God would give me a word and I'd share it to them. Then I'd pray about this area in my life and God is silent. Like, okay, God, are you rejecting me? Don't you want to talk to me? What's wrong? Then I pray again and there's nothing. Then I pray for someone else and there's a word. Then I pray about other areas of my life and God speaks. But in this specific area, there was just nothing. So I decided to ask a lady in the church for help. And she prayed with me, and then she comes back to me with this wonderful feedback, and she says, God says he's spoken to you, but you're not listening. <laughs> now, in that moment, I had a choice to make. I could say to her what the people said in Jesus' hometown. Who do you think you are to tell me that I'm not listening to God? And I could have rejected her and taken offense at her and what she was saying because I didn't like what she was saying. But when she shared the message, I chose to believe this is a person sent by God. And I received her word. And when I received her word, it suddenly dawned on me. You know what? I've heard this before. Where have I heard this? Oh, my mom said this last week. But I disqualified the messenger. Maybe it's because she didn't specifically say, the Lord says you should do this. All she said was, do this. And I was like, what do you know? <laughs> Ouch, right? But I disqualified the messenger. And if I had disqualified the second messenger, I would have lost the blessing of the Lord. Because guys, this is the consequence of not receiving the messenger. Everywhere else Jesus went, wherever he sent his 12, lives were changed. Can you imagine what it must be like to be the parents of that little girl who was raised from the dead? Or to be the woman who'd been bleeding for 12 years and to have received her healing? And these are just two. There are countless miracles recorded in just the first five chapters of this book. The people received the blessing of the Lord when they accepted who was sent by God. So when we reject the messenger of the Lord, we lose the blessing. There's so many things we ask God for and we don't receive it because we don't acknowledge who he's sending it with. So, that's my story. <laughs> but rejection is painful. It is, right? We don't want to have to deal with it. But what about these people in my hometown who reject the person on that video because they think he's a charlatan? I don't know if he is. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. For all I know, he prayed for the person in the name of Jesus and the person received the healing. It's as simple as that. If he is a charlatan, God will take care of that. But what about those people who attack the Christian faith because of it? Their hearts have been hardened to the things of the Lord. And the result of that is that they cannot grow their faith. You cannot grow your faith if you won't hear the word because you've rejected who the word is coming through. So what do we do? Do we take offense at these people who will reject you? Many of you sitting here today are going to face the same fate. When Jesus sent out his 12, he prepared them for rejection. In fact, he said to them, stay only where they will receive you and listen to you, where they welcome you. If a place does not welcome you, dust your feet and move on. In fact, leave a testimony against them. That's what Jesus says. So he prepared his 12 when he sent them, you're going to be rejected. We've been called to follow Jesus. So many of you sitting here now just say, okay, Lord, 
I'm going to be rejected. But what do you do when you are rejected? Do you take offense? We forgive the people. That is why, guys, we do the Matthew 18 thing here so much. If you're still harboring an offense with someone in the church, are you able to receive from them when God uses them to bring you the word? No. That's why we say, sort the stuff out. Sort it out. So what we do when people reject the messenger of the Lord is we pray for them. And we say, God, please will you send someone to them who they can receive from. Please will you soften their hearts to the things of you. It is because of their hardened hearts that they miss the word of the Lord. Because here's the thing, guys. Everybody wants the secret to life. I'm going to tell you the secret to life. People want to be empowered. We are empowered. Because we cannot change how other people will receive us, but we can change how we will receive others. So people go to seminars and conferences and they're like, empower me. I want to be successful in life. You want the secret to life? Here it is. You don't have to pay for it. It's free. (laughs) Receive the messenger of the Lord. Where you receive the messenger of the Lord, where you receive the word of the Lord, you receive the blessing of the Lord. Because here's the thing. Even your very salvation... Your eternal life is credited to you having accepted who God sent. You accepted, Jesus is going to die for me. Jesus died for me. If you had not accepted that he was the person, you don't have eternal life. So, what's the secret to life? Receive the messenger. If you will not receive the person God sends to you, you will not receive all that God has in store for you. So this morning, before you leave, sit here and ask the Lord to show you, Father, have I hardened my heart to somebody you've sent to me? Am I missing what you have for me because I won't receive it from the person you are wanting to give it to me through? That person could be the person you least expect it to be. It could be someone half your age. In this church, Matthew and James bring most of the words, and I think they are one of the youngest people here, or two of the youngest people here. Can you receive from them? Can you receive husbands from your wives? Wives from your husbands? Parents from your children? I've heard the kids in kids' church, when they pray, they bring the word of the Lord. Can you receive from them, even when it's something you don't want to hear? Because if we can humble ourselves to receive from whoever God chooses to use, instead of asking why this person and why that person and why not me, you will receive the blessing of the Lord. And aren't we glad that we can experience the blessing of the Lord here on earth? Amen. 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 Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we want to thank you this morning that you make it so clear for us in the text. You show us that you were rejected and you've made provision for us when we are rejected. You prepare our hearts for it, that we can come to you when we are rejected, that we can have kindness and compassion on those that reject us, and that we can pray for them for your grace and your mercy, that you would send people to them that will soften their hearts. We pray for our own hearts this morning, Lord, that even before we leave here today, we make right with you where we've hardened our hearts against your people. We acknowledge, Lord, that you want us to acknowledge your people. We acknowledge this morning that it is your way to use people, that you've always sent someone, and that we open our hearts to receive the people you send, even when it is someone that we don't expect it to be. We say sorry now, Lord Jesus, for where we've, we've hardened our hearts, and we change our minds, we repent, 
and we open our hearts to receive from your people. We thank you, Lord, that where we do receive your people, your blessing is promised to us. There's healing, there's deliverance from evil spirits, there's miracles, there's signs and wonders, things we haven't even, even dipped our toes in the water of that you have in store for us. But we say this morning, we want to experience these things. We don't want to just stand back and be amazed at your teaching and be amazed at what you do, but to reject who you send. We just give you praise, glory, and honor now, Lord Jesus. And we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.